of the Coulomb force, they tend to balance. And you can achieve a, a contraction of the spring when you pull charge out, and if you put in electrical current, then you stretch the spring a little bit. And of course, very little voltage uh, is needed, as you see, to achieve the effect. So this really, I think, provoked, even if he was not very successful in designing something uh, practical, it provoked a lot of thought. Uh, this one article basically, I think, caused a tremendous amount of thinking of Casimir plates, how to design them, what geometry would work, and, um, and, and the engineering approach, of course, is the most important. So the zero-point energy basics uh, that we're looking at here um, really is the uh, bottom line in terms of the um, important facts. And I would like to also add in this particular slide that the uncertainty principle, which you may have heard of as the basis of quantum mechanics, the uncertainty principle itself predicts zero-point energy. When you're looking at an uncertainty in momentum and, and position, and you're equating it to um, just the uh, Planck's constant in the frequency over two, that's essentially the zero-point energy quantum amount. It's basically half of a quantum. And we see the same figure here, one-half HF. In 1912, Planck discovered zero-point energy, and it was sec his second time around. The first time, his first radiation law just had this parameter. And what I always point out when I, I show this equation is um, if you do some creative math and you put in t equals zero there, which is the absolute temperature, if you let it go to zero, then you basically get one over zero, which is infinity. E to infinity is still infinity. But then you've got hf over infinity, which is zero. So at temperature equals zero, this whole term drops out and you're left with one-half hf. So this became the... Um, introduction to really thinking about and acknowledging the existence of zero-point energy. And Planck's constant, in case you don't know, have memorized the numbers right down here, 6.6 .6 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds. Now, joules, of course, is a unit of energy. Uh, when you get your electric bill and you have so many kilowatts uh, that are being kilowatt hours that are being delivered to you, that's equivalent to joules. Uh, you're really canceling out the times. Watts are really joules per second. And if you multiply joules per second times time, which could be in seconds, then you're left with joules. So your electric company right now is billing you in the number of joules you use, but they don't call it that. They just call it kilowatt hours. But that's how important joules are. And the energy of an elementary radiator perhaps might be a little bit too abstract for people to um, accept. But the elementary radiator literally is either a quantum of space or a quantum of matter. And whether you look at either one, you're still looking at zero-point energy fluctuations being uh, present there. And this graphic actually shows the uh, concept of zero-point um, being on a spring that's moving randomly. <clears throat> so you get basically a random uh, signal and random fluctuations. Now, the interesting thing is that as we look at the um, fluctuations in general, we may not necessarily conceive of uh, an, an important um, way to use that or understand the uh, value of it. And the way I approached it, first of all, as I was looking at a number of different experimental approaches, is I wanted to get a philosophical understanding first. And what I came across was this particular theorem. And it's a systems theory theorem, and the fluctuation dissipation theorem essentially introduces and proves that zero-point energy is intrinsically connected to the concept of dissipation. And to me, this was, you know, um, counterintuitive. In fact, it, it's still to this day, I believe, um, for many of us who have studied this, it, it, it challenges you to understand why is there any relationship between the two phenomena at all. So let me explain what this is. When we first start with this particular uh, article, this is from 1951. And in 1951, Callan and Welton um, basically published a very short article and very readable article called Irreversibility and Generalized Noise. 
And in the title of this article, you see the um, essential components of the fluctuation dissipation theorem. In fact, they basically prove it in their article. So in Physical Review, Volume 83, 1951, they were introducing that this concept of generalized noise in any system and an irreversibility of energy loss is actually intrinsically the same thing. There are two sides of a coin, perhaps complementary in some way. <clears throat> and he originally applied it to what's called Johnson noise. Now, the reason I emphasize Johnson noise is that we've now just received a breakthrough, uh, and, and I'll refer to that in a later slide, where a Dr. Beck from London University has shown that Johnson noise now is the best measurement of zero-point energy. And he's comparing it with dark energy, which is the universe's uh, term, astronomer's term, for the universal acceleration of, of galaxies away from each other. So back in 51, this was already uh, the starting point. You know, goes around, comes around, well, <laughs> you're sort of seeing that, that right here. And uh, electro-engineers will recognize the Nyquist um, concepts. And the um, basic equation essentially looks at a resistive component and an energy component. And it applies to electrical systems, to various weather systems. Uh, you'd be surprised how much uh, diverse applications there are in this article. But the existence of any dissipation, like radi radiation resistance, necessitates the randomly fluctuating electric field. And the authors actually apply this to the uh, electric field concept because originally the zero-point field was simply called the all-pervading electromagnetic field. And um, it was funny, in my um, work at State University of New York in Buffalo, uh, the, the only time I heard God ever mentioned in a physics class was when the zero-point uh, electromagnetic field was mentioned. And this was a Chinese professor, as a matter of fact. Uh, and I was very intrigued, uh, but, but it's perhaps because it's so philosophically challenging that this field is all-pervading and so energetic. So to quote from the uh, Callan and Welton article, uh, they state, quote, generally speaking, if a system is coupled to a bath that can take energy from the system in an effectively irreversible way, just like your drain in your bath dissipates your water, then the bath must also cause fluctuations. The fluctuations and dissipation go hand in hand. We cannot have one without the other. The coupling of a dipole oscillator to the electromagnetic field has a dissipative component in the form of radiation reaction and a fluctuation component in the form of zero-point vacuum field. Given the existence of radiation reaction, the vacuum field must also exist in order to preserve the canonical commutation rule and all it uh, entails. And so the existence of radiation impedance for the electromagnetic radiation from an oscillating charge is shown to imply the fluctuation electric field. And of course, that yields the Planck radiation law. So to me, this is a, a fascinating part because the zero point field in many ways has been um, allowed to be fluctuating you don't necessarily allow for energy to come from it, but this particular one um, phenomena describes that radiation resistance has to be a part of it. And it becomes even more significant when you look at spontaneous um, um, radiation. The spontaneous emission from any atom that's sitting there, many of us might know the difference in physics class, for example, even in high school physics, where they teach the basics of lasers, and the laser operation. Well, as you look at the laser operation, you're looking at an inverted level, and you stimulate the electrons, and then they fall and give a light out. And it's coherent emission. Well, stimulated emission is one thing, but nature has also had spontaneous emission forever. In fact, everything that you're looking at right now has basically spontaneous emission. In other words, the atoms choose when they want to emit light. Um, and even if they have an input of energy, there's a certain amount of uh, uncertainty for the emission to take place. Well, as it turns out, it's been proven mathematically now uh, that there's half and half sharing. Radiation reaction contributes half of that, and the zero-point field contributes the other half. So 
Without um, beating a dead horse, we now got a very important 